The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. On today's program, we're going to make a return trip to the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. This time, we check out the beautiful glass sculpture work of Craig Mitchell Smith. Then, we turn our attention to things in the garden that we can drink. Honeybees help us pollinate our plants, and we can also make mead out of the honey. Kevin Blake and Matt Coe show us how. And Chef Stephen Larson demonstrates a tasty recipe for mojito spritzers. Stay with us. Garden Connections is next. Bees are an important part of gardening, and today Kevin Blake and Matt Coe teach us how to make a delicious beverage from honey. Welcome to Garden Connections, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, mead, I've heard of it before, don't know a lot about it. Tell me a little bit about the history of this beverage. Well, it's actually, honey bee has been around for as long as we know, and uh, the honey has, uh, was actually found in King Tut's tomb, was edible even, after wow. thousands of years. Uh -huh. uh, honey, water, and yeast, and you got mead, uh, that's a, called a show mead. Uh, okay. It's a fermented beverage, uh, you can add fruit, which makes it makes it mellow mel. Mellow That's mel. what okay. we're going to be doing today. And Matt's going to show us how to do that today. Okay. Yep. So honey's been around a long time. This is actually a fermented, so it's an alcoholic beverage. Yes. So not for children, but nope, but something nope. adults can enjoy. Give us a general overview of the process. You know, he's, he said there are very few ingredients. What, what are you going to do to this stuff today, Matt? Well, we're going to take about 11 pounds of honey. Uh, we're going to add some boiling water to it to kill any any wild yeast that's in there. Uh, we're going to top it up with water. We're going to add some fresh fruit, uh, some metabisulfite tablets that will kill any wild yeast that's on the fruit. Okay, what um, would wild yeast do to your mead? It would change the flavor. Sometimes you'll get uh, bitter alcohols oh. from that, mm -hmm. different, different types of alcohol from different yeast. We're going to be using a champagne yeast, okay. which makes the best mead. Makes the best mead. And I want to talk a little bit about this honey. It's already in the bucket and it's really sticky. Tell us a little bit about this. We see this sometimes in our cupboard when it crystallizes and then people think it's gone bad, but that's not true, is it? No, it never goes bad. <laughs> It'll be good as, as long as you've got it, as long as you keep insects out of it. Mm -hmm. um, you can warm that back up in, in a warm pan of water, mm -hmm. uh, not boiling because it'll kill some of the nutrients in there, but uh, you can warm it back up and it'll be liquid again. And liquid again. And you were telling me, Kevin, make sure you know the source of your honey because yeah. you don't want to be making meat out of something else. Right. The, there's a lot of products out there, uh, honey syrup, which would actually have some corn sugar in it. Mm -hmm. You want to use a 100% pure honey. And it's best so if you can get from your local beekeeper. Local beekeeper, yep. yep. All right, so we're going to get set up here with some equipment. We're going to get started in just a minute. In the meantime, we're going to send you to the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Craig Mitchell Smith does some beautiful things with glass sculpture. Take a look. The Minnesota Landscape Arboretum is home to thousands of plant species, a veritable delight for gardeners everywhere you look. This summer, tucked among the gardens is a spectacular exhibit, Nature in Glass, The Wonders of Craig Mitchell Smith. Barbara DeGroat, PR specialist for the Arboretum, explains why they included this remarkable display. We're always looking for new ways to engage the public with our gardens and the beauty of nature. And by bringing in Craig Mitchell Smith's wonderful sculptures, people really take time to appreciate the gardens and the surroundings that, you know, around the artwork. So it's really a great uh, combination, beautiful artwork and beautiful gardens. He really seems to be sensitive to nature and he appreciates gardens and flowers. He spent a, an entire week here last summer studying our gardens, walking the grounds, looking for inspiration for his glass sculptures. So many of the pieces were specifically designed and made to fit in our gardens.
Craig Mitchell Smith is a Michigan artist and he originally was more into interior design and he uh, became really interested in glass uh, about 10 years ago and has since that time he's done several exhibitions in public gardens around the United States, Norfolk Gardens, Dow Gardens, and he most recently was exhibiting at Epcot Center. So uh, we're very fortunate to have him. a child he would spend a lot of time in his grandmother's home and she had some old glass medicine bottles blue glass different colors and he was just drawn to these medicine bottles and uh, on occasion you know like any kid he would break them and then he just would be fascinated trying to put them back together again and so it's just kind of, you can kind of see how he was drawn, he's been drawn to glass throughout his life. more than 30 pieces in the exhibit, it's hard to pick a favorite, but Barb highlights some of hers. I guess my favorite is called Making a Wish, and it's a large 15-foot dandelion puff ball. It's one of the most intriguing pieces. Um, it's, it reflects everyone's childhood fantasies of dreams and hopes, and people of all ages are drawn to it. Flight of the Monarchs, I love it. These, the glass monarch butterflies flying into the air and it's very realistic and it's just a very hopeful statue. Most of the uh, sculptures are within walking distance of our visitor center and Snyder building. So it's a very accessible uh, exhibit. People can wander and it's fun to discover these on your own without a guide. And sometimes you just do a double take because they fit so well into the environment. People have come up to me and said, these are amazing and this is one of their favorite exhibits that they've ever enjoyed here at the Arboretum. And I think we're drawing in a lot of art lovers. We, we always have uh, attracted garden lovers, but we're, we're this is really, wonderful because we're drawing in another demographic. A lot of art lovers are coming to see this exhibit. They are inspired and delighted and uh, it's a wonderful exhibit if you're a photographer. Photographers are just going crazy because the light going through the glass is just wonderful. The beautiful sculptures elicit a variety of responses and have drawn new visitors to the Arboretum.
we're back and we're ready to get started to make our meat. And the first thing you're going to do is add this hot water. Is this boiling hot water? We brought it just to a boil. It's uh, yeah, you, it's got it helps break the honey down. It's pretty solidified. And Matt, you're going to use this giant mixer. I'm going to yep. I'm going to beat that up. It's got a special adapter here on the bottom. Yep. And yep. this is just a regular cordless drill, right? Yep. That will infuse a little bit of oxygen in there. That's what the yeast needs to to feed off of. Okay. So we'll put some nutrients and some, some oxygen in it. Sounds good. And for safety's sake, we're going to stick this on the floor, right? Okay. Makes it a little easier to reach, too. So we've got this big cordless grill, drill with an attachment. Where do you find an attachment like that? Um, at your local brew shop. Okay. So how long does this take? Just a couple minutes to get About it About two minutes dissolved? of stirring, and then we'll add some more water and we'll stir it again. Okay. You let me know when it's done. It's done. It's done. All right. So, so we're back up on the table. We should add more water first and okay. stir it again. We do with our water. Right more water? There. So this is not heated water that you're adding? No. no we want to cool this down a little bit now. Uh, the yeast will die at anything over 80 degrees. Okay. We want this around 70 to 75 degrees when we when we pitch the yeast. And our fruit is cold, that'll bring it down some too. Okay, you have a very full bucket now. Yes, that's and actually And it's all smooth, ready. kind of an amber looking liquid. Yep. Okay, so back up on the table with this. Okay. There we go. And it's kind of foamy, is that okay? Yep, yep. It'll, when that yeast starts working, it's, it'll, foam will reach the top of the bucket. Oh, okay, the bucket all right. So you've got about starts. five inches or so before yep. the top of the bucket. So what you, comes next? Uh, we're gonna add some, we can add the nutrient right away. Um, we're just gonna put a little bit of nutrient in the bucket for the yeast to feed off of. Okay. We'll sprinkle that so on the top. So the natural sugar of the honey isn't enough? It's not enough. This gives it a little bit more of what it actually needs, um, and it'll improve the flavor a little bit. And then, do you stir this? Yep. The I'll same stir thing with that the blender? Um, you can do, do you it with the blender, spoon? or I can do it with my spoon. All right. And then, Kevin, the fruit comes next? Yep. Is that I'm right? I'm going to add the fruit. And tell us about the fruit you've chosen for today. Um, this is a boysenberry. Um, they're not a local boysenberry, it's frozen, but they're, they're a fresh, fresh frozen boysenberry. And it's in kind of a mesh bag. Do yep. you just leave it in the bag? Yep, yep, it's in a straining bag. That keeps, keeps too much of the residue from settling in the bottom of your bucket when we pull the bag out after it's fermented. That we, it all comes Most with. of it stays in there. Okay. So. Then we got to add some Camden tablets. This is Camden. Uh, this is that? all. It's actually uh, potassium metabosulfite. You put one tablet per gallon, and it uh, kills the wild yeast. Like Matt's saying, you want to you want your yeast in there for a certain flavor. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're going to get if you just leave the wild yeast. So right. we've got right. so uh, some consistency. Six, oops, six tablets. I've already okay. yep. I've already crushed yep. them. And you've got those right here. Yep. Right? So it's just in a little. It's already been smashed, and it's important just so it dissolves faster. Is that right? Yes. Yep. And the, the effects of that are going to dissipate after 24 hours. So we add that. You, you're not going to want to put the yeast in yet. You're going to add that, stir it in, mm -hmm. and you can put your lid back on or a cheesecloth, mm -hmm. and then that'll dissipate 24 hours, then you add your yeast. And I'm assuming you don't want to put this right on your cloth bag. You'd want to sprinkle it inside. He's going to stir it up. And okay. Yep. So we'll just... You actually want that on the fruit as well. Oh, you do? Yeah, because okay. there's wild yeast on that, so. Okay. So I should have sprinkled it right over the top. It, it's gonna, it'll, it'll, it'll get there, no, yep. It'll, it'll kill everything in the bucket, all the wild yeast. Mm -hmm. So that's about it. So just a gentle stir. So you've yep. got your water, your honey, your fruit, 
some sanitizing kind of, what did you cut, Camden? Camden. Camden. Yep. Yep. And some nutrients. What next? Lid? Put the lid, lid on. Wait 24 hours and we'll pitch the yeast. We'll sprinkle yeast okay. on top. Okay. Leave it for about a week and it'll be fermented. Okay. And this is important. I know we haven't put the yeast in here yet because you just put something in there to kind of kill the wild yeast. Talk a little bit about this little device. What does this do for your That allows the CO2 to dissipate. Uh, the yeast is going to eat oxygen. Mm -hmm. It feeds off oxygen and it'll release CO2. And that CO2, if it, if it stays in your wine or in your mead, will actually ruin it. You need to, okay. you need to dissipate that CO2. Okay. So this is so. kind of like an airlock. It lets it out, yep. but doesn't let anything in. in that you don't want. And before we do that, we actually need to take a specific gravity reading so that we know when the mead is done. Okay, um, and what does that measure? It's gonna, it's gonna measure the sugar solution. Okay. Um, and when the yeast has eaten all of the sugar in the bucket, it'll be done. And from that, how much sugar is in the bucket now to the finished product, we can measure the alcohol content from okay. that. So you kind of, you so. have some tools that tell you what's going on. Yeah, and that when bucket. it's done. All right, sounds good. So we've got a couple more steps left, but now we're gonna send you out to Chef Steven Larson. And he's got another recipe for you to try with some ingredients from your garden. It's mojito spritzers. Welcome back to the kitchen. Anybody that's been to a high-end restaurant these days knows about what we're calling craft cocktails. Now, craft cocktails is just a fancy name for something that's a little different, a little more unusual, and has taken a little more time and effort gone into it to make something that's a little extra special. So I'm gonna show you how to make a couple of those that you can have at home. The first one is a spin on a classic mojito, and I'm calling mine a mojito spritzer. Uh, in order to make that, we need to make a simple syrup. Now, both of these use an infused simple syrup. Basically, that just means taking equal parts sugar and water, bringing it to a boil, and then adding whatever you're going to infuse it with, letting it steep like a tea for about five minutes. So that's what I've done here with the mint. So we're gonna use a mint simple syrup here for the mojito. I'm going to strain out the mint. And we'll press on that a bit to get all that liquid out. Okay, set that aside. So and then this is going to form the basis for the rest of the drink. To that, I'm going to add a quarter cup of fresh lime juice and also three quarters cup white rum. And we'll take a large pitcher, pour that mixture in, and to that we're going to add 12 ounces of sparkling drinking water. Now when you do this at home, you should chill these to make sure that they're nice and cold first. Give that a bit of a stir glass full of ice, and of course to make it pretty, sprig of mint in the top, and maybe a little wedge of key lime. And there's our mojito spritzer. Next up, we're going to make a vodka infused thyme and lavender lemonade. So for that, we're gonna do another simple syrup. This one has a small bunch of thyme and a tablespoon of lavender flowers uh, that I've already infused into that. We'll strain those out. Again, pressing to make sure that we get all the liquid out of there. A 
Then to finish this one up, we will add half a cup of lemon juice and three quarters cup of vodka. Now whenever you're making cocktails, especially craft cocktails, one of their signature points is to use a high quality liquor. So don't skimp on that. Make sure you're using a very good one. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll put the flavored infusion into the pitcher. We'll add 12 ounces sparkling drinking water. Give that just a quick stir. Fill it on up. And with this one, of course, we want an appropriate garnish, so we'll use lemon. And we'll cut a nice little wheel off of there. Put it on the side, and I have some beautiful fresh thyme here. And we'll just pop one of those right on the edge. Okay, so there we have it. Mojito Spritzer and Vodka Thyme Lavender Lemonade. Just desserts for a hard day of work in the garden. We're back and we are making mead with Kevin Blake and Matt Coe. Now you used boysenberries this time. Can you use any kind of fruit yes. to make this? Yes. So melamel just refers to a fruit infused, a fruit. doesn't matter what kind. That's correct. All right, so we're gonna let that sit, you mentioned for five days. Then you're going to, you called it siphoning, was that right, yep. Kevin, that you told me? Put it in a carboy, is yep. that what you call this? Same topper. We put a little rubber stopper a with rubber that stopper. same airlock. Same, same type of airlock. You, again, you don't want any oxygen at this point. Okay. And it won't let oxygen in, lets the CO2 out. Yep, your yeast is doing its work. How long yeah. are you going to leave it in here? Mead, you could leave months. It, uh, some, you want it, it's going to clear. And uh, after two or three months, you could move it again into another carboy mm -hmm. or just let it sit in that. And, uh, okay. You're not going to want to drink it for two or three years. Okay, uh, so this is something you really want to let sit. Yes. Okay, and it just it mellows the flavor. Is that right? Makes it what yes. I would call softer. Yep. It uh, to start out with the the alcohol flavor is quite harsh in, in mead, and uh, the berries that he puts in mm -hmm. that berry flavor is going to come out much more after two or three years, right. and then and the alcohol flavor will mellow out. Okay. Do you leave it in a carboy or do you, you brought some bottles here. Do you bottle it? At what stage do you put it in a bottle? You can leave it, you can age it in the carboy as well. You don't want to bottle it until it's very clear because it, okay. it won't clear in the bottle. I mean, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll stay that way. Okay. And that's so, what happens when you move it from one to the other. You kind of siphon out anything that's settled? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you're leaving all the sediment behind every time you move it. And and then, uh, yeah, bottle it. You could probably bottle it a minimum of three or four months, but you can leave it for a year or two in the carboy as well. Okay, so it's not going to hurt it to keep it in. No. All right. Just as long as you keep the airlock with water keep it in going. it. All right. Matt, tell us a little bit about the samples that you brought today. Okay. I think this is a cherry mead. Yes. That, right? that, that Kevin's made. This is, this is a peach mead uh, that I made. Uh, this one's about three years old. I think this is a year old. About a year. About a year old. All right. Um, so beautiful you color to see. that. Yeah, it's got a very nice color. Does the color change dramatically with the type of fruit that you use? Yes. yes. It, it Just a show mead, pure honey is going to be real golden color. Very, very pretty golden color. But nice. Looks beautiful. How does it smell? It's got a really beautiful smell. You can tell there's cherry in there. Yeah. Nice color too. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us on how to make mead. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the program. I look forward to seeing you next time. For Garden Connections, I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, 
contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook. Thank you.